Thanks for joining us online today. If you've been impacted by this ministry and have a story to share of how God is working in your life, we would love to hear it. Send an email to amen at anchorpoint.tv. Also, you can help bring messages just like this one to others who need to hear the hope and the love of Jesus by investing today at anchorpoint.tv slash give. Now, we hope you enjoy today's message. Pastor Ryan has such a unique gift and calling on his life, an excellent communicator. Pastor Ryan, you can come on up. I've actually asked him to wrap up this series as we get ready uh, to end the series. We've been in for four weeks on Pastor Jonah. Pastor Jonah, I'm just messing it all up today. <laughs> Pastor Jonah, yeah. Yeah, we're, he could, no, I, after today, he is not Pastor Jonah. So grab your message notes, put your hands together for Pastor Ryan. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, he will not be Pastor Jonah by the end of the day today. And I'm honored to be with you today, though, to wrap up this series that we've been in. And this will be the fourth week that we've been in it um, called The Runaway, really based on the story and the book of Jonah. And um, we've been kind of diving deep into this. And Pastor Todd started this series with the idea that we wanted to take sort of a grown-up look at what's really known as a Sunday school story. And so over the last four weeks, we have done that kind of diving deep into the story of Jonah. We're going to wrap it up today. And if you were with us last week, you might think it kind of, kind of odd that we're wrapping up this week instead of last week. And if you weren't here with us, allow me to get you on the same page. Last week, we see Jonah actually do what God told him to do. Not before, though, running 2,500 miles in the wrong direction, uh, being thrown off a ship in the middle of the sea, being swallowed by a fish, and then spit up on the shores of Nineveh where he was supposed to be all along. And then he actually goes, very wisely, goes into Nineveh and does what God told him to do. And we see that he, he goes in and preaches this worst sermon ever, repent, turn around, it's going to be destroyed in 40 days. And the people of Nineveh actually do. They turn from their sin and turn to God and actually, chapter 3, uh, verse 10, the, the end of chapter 3 actually says like this. God saw what they did, how they had turned from their evil ways, and he relented and not, did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. Well, hallelujah. It should end there, right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Jonah is God's man of power, the man of the hour, too sweet to be sour. Yeah. Right? That's, uh, Jonah's got to be elated right now. He's got to be on top of the world. God just used him to bring about a revival. But, as we'll see today, Jonah was still a little salty. And before we even dive into key thoughts and message titles or anything like that, I want to read you the very first verse of the last chapter in the book of Jonah. And I want you to see where Jonah stands after this great miracle. Jonah chapter 4 verse 1 says this. God just used him. It's incredible. Should be elated. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Jo Jonah. I mean, don't you feel like, you know, Joe, listen, Joe, really? Really? We've gotten to know him over these last few weeks, and re re really, God had done, just done an incredible work through Jonah. Over 120,000 people came to know, know the Lord because of Jonah's sermon, because of his obedience. Yeah. Scholars believe the largest revival in all of the Bible. And God had just used Jonah to do that. And he's not elated. He's not exuberant. The only thing Jonah can manage to muster is being offended. He's offended. He's just offended. And so I want you to help me announce the title of today's message. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, I've waited all week to sit next to you. Just so I can tell you. And I want you to look them deep in their eyes. Say, get over it. Some of y'all been waiting to tell the person you're sitting next to for a long time. Just get over it. Just get over it. Jonah's offended, but he's not unlike you. I mean, have you noticed that we live in the age and the era of offense? Everybody, everywhere is perpetually offended about everything all the time. Always offended. Being easily offended is no longer seen as a weakness in our character, but instead it is our constitutional right. 
Oh, you're not a, what did he say to you? You're not offended. I'm offended for you, right? Everybody is offended. You're offended. And you're offended that I would say that about you, right? Everybody is offended about everything. And some of you, it's almost as like we don't live in the U.S. of A anymore. Instead, we live in the U.S. of O because everybody's in the United States of offense. Everybody is offended. Men are offended. Women are offended. The millennials are offended. The boomers are offended. Right? Republicans are offended. Democrats are offended. The atheists are offended. Even the saints are offended. The New Orleans saints are offended still. I, I mean, it's a, everybody, vegans and vegetarians are offended. As a matter of fact, I did a little research this week, and as I, I stumbled on this, if you just, you'll stumble onto it as well. Just type offended into Google, scroll down the page just a little bit, and you'll find an article about vegetarians and vegans. Not all of them are bad. I know some good ones, okay, but these are crazy. <laughs> who are offended and say that we should get rid of meat-based metaphors. I can't make it up. I promise. They are calling for the removal of meat-based metaphors. Phrases such as, bring home the bacon. <laughs> Should be removed and instead replaced with less offensive, more health-conscious phrases such as, bring home the bagels. <laughs> they are calling for the removal. Even, even animal rights activists are getting on board and saying that some of these common sayings are offensive and actually promote harm of animals. Phrases such as beating a dead horse and killing two birds with one stone should instead be removed and replaced with phrases such as feeding a fed horse and feeding two birds with one scone. <laughs> and my favorite one of all, they are saying we should remove the phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat and instead replace it with the phrase, there's more than one way to peel a potato. I figure I was safe with a cat joke since we're talking about offense here. So much so, they are offended so much so that even some vegans and vegetarians are going outside of steakhouses in protest and playing the sounds of slaughtered cows over loudspeakers as people enjoy their ribeye. They are so offended that they're willing to do that. And the manager comes out to the front and says, oh, no, 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 y'all can't do this. Y'all got to move. <laughs> Preacher humor, I just had to do it. <laughs> and they will get arrested because they're so offended. Everybody's offended. And listen, let's be honest. You have that one thing that if at the right time, on the right day, when you forgot to pray, somebody presses that button, you'll end up in the cell right next to the activists, okay? <laughs> we all have that one thing. We all have something. And listen, our text today is in Jonah chapter 4, but I, I figured it never hurts to see what Jesus has to say about a topic that we're talking about. So in Matthew 24, offense actually comes up. And Jesus' disciples were asking him about the end times. They're like, Jesus, when do we know you're going to come back or your kingdom? He's like, listen, you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of signs. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. But then he says this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. I want to throw it on the screens. It says, and also at that time, many will be what? Offended. In other words, disciples, one of the blues clues that I'm coming back is that we will live in the age and the era of offense. Everybody is going to be offended, right? As a matter of fact, too, in Luke chapter 17, Jesus is talking to his disciples specifically. Any disciples of Jesus in here? Any dis Two of y'all. Okay, great. Great to have you today, all right? Um, and, and so he's actually talking to his disciples, to his disciples. And he says this. He said to his disciples in Luke 17, 10, we'll throw it on the screen. He says this, what? Offenses will certainly come. Not maybe, not could not possibly, certainly come. Jesus is saying it is unavoidable that offenses will come into your life. It's part of being a human being. It's part of it. You can't get away from it. But did you notice the difference in those two words? In Matthew 24, 10, in Luke 17, offended 
an offense is. Jesus didn't misplace his words. He didn't add an extra letter on the end. He was very particular in it because there's a difference between being offended and having offenses. There's a difference between offenses and offend. An offense is what happened. Offended is a reaction. Offense is an event. Offended is a decision. A lot of you thought Jesus was going to let you off the hook for being offended, but he's not. And so what I want us to do today, I want you to write down this key thought. Let's, let's set, the, set the pace for all of today. Here's what I want you to understand. The state of being offended, the state that so many people are in right now, offended is optional. Offended is optional. Listen, Jesus says offenses are inevitable, but being offended is optional. It's, Jesus is saying it's possible for you to live a life unoffended. We don't even know what that looks like. We can't even fathom it. But Jesus says, just like Jonah, you and I have a choice. So that leads me to a question as I prepare for this message. I heard a pastor ask this question, and I, I've been waiting to propose it to you all week long. Here's my question. What is your level of offendability? What is your level of offendability? Because our level of offendability is directly tied to our level of spiritual maturity. Our level of offendability is directly tied to our level of spiritual maturity. Often, God will put your miracle on the other side of an offense so that you have a choice to make. I can stay on this side and stay small, or I can grow up and get over it. And some of you today has got some growing up to do. I have some growing up to do because my level of offendability is too high. Whenever I heard the preacher ask this question, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, that's you. That's me? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like somebody says something to you like, me? Yeah. He said, that's you. I said, but, he said you get offended too easily. I don't get it. No, not me. I don't get offended too. I got thick skin. I could, I could. I could cut up with the best of them. You got a remark, I could pop one back off, okay? But I knew that God was right. That I am too easily offended. And when God spoke that to me, boy, I tell you what, I didn't praise him. I didn't worship him. I didn't do a Holy Ghost dance. I got offended. I swear, I did. I'm not kidding. I didn't talk to Jesus for a whole day. Like, no, all right, if that's how it's going to be. And don't you know, nobody can offend you like the Lord, yeah. right? He knows how to offend you. It's in, it's in Jesus' very nature to be offensive. As a matter of fact, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the truth by nature is offensive. The truth by nature is offensive. Offensive, and sometimes Jesus will have to tick you off with the truth before that truth will transform you. And so Jesus is, he, he's, you're, Jesus is like toddlers, spandex, and drunk people. You're going to get the truth whether you like it or not. And in this moment when, when God was speaking to me, He's saying, hey, right, you, you get offended too easily. I said, but what? I, I don't understand. And God said, listen, I have big things for you. I have huge things in store for you. I got bigger things than you can even imagine. No eye has seen, no ear has heard the, the things that God has in store for you. But he said, I can't give you the big things if it only takes the smallest thing for you to get offended. And I feel like God's speaking that to you today, to our church. He's like, listen, God's got big things for you, huge things. But he cannot give you those big things if all it takes is the smallest thing for you to get offended. And I feel like we're in a season like that as our church as well. Like, hey, we, we got to be comfortable being who God has called us to be. And we can't worry about what other people say because we can't, ha we can't access the things that God has for us if we're always worried about reacting to what people say about us. So God wants to give you big things, but he can't give you big things 
if all it takes is the smallest thing to set you off. Offense messes up all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. And there's a few things that we can learn from the story of Jonah today, the very last chapter, the last interaction we're going to have with him. There's a few things that I really think we can figure out um, that offense really messes up and really is detrimental to in our lives. We can learn it from Jonah. So if you're writing your notes down, write down point number one. Uh, offended, the state of offended alters your outlook. Offended alters your outlook. Let's look at the origin of why Jonah is offended. We read verse one. Jonah's he's mad. He's furious. He's offended. And then he says this in verse two. He prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled towards Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And Jonah's like, listen, this is like, this is why I didn't do it in the first place. What's happening right now? You ever been in a place God told you to do something, you did it, and then it played out, and you're like, look, see what you did? Okay, you told me to do it. I did it. Didn't you know this was going to happen? Didn't you know even before you told me you're supposed to be all-knowing? Now look what's happened. And John's like, hey, God, this is why I ran. This is why I used my Delta Frequent Flyer miles to go to Tarshish, okay, to get away from this thing because I didn't want this to happen. You happy? And he's upset, so upset. He, uh, listen, I, I don't even want to live anymore, okay? I'm done. I did it. You told me. To, I did what you told me to do. I'm done now, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm over it. And Jonah's so mad because the Ninevites were sworn enemies to the Israelites. And so Jonah is mad that God let his enemy off the hook. He's mad that God left his enemy off the hook. God actually decided to give grace to the Ninevites instead of judgment. Don't we do the same thing? I want grace when I mess up. Oh, but you cross me? Uh-uh, boo-boo. Ain't happening. I want to be, I'm going to be offended. Oh, commented on my Facebook post. You see what they said? You see what, yep, you see what, see, God wants to give you big things, but he can't if it takes the smallest thing for you to get offended. And some of you get offended at the drop of a comment. Some of you get offended when someone says, roll tide or war eagle. Some of you get offended when your neighbor cuts your grass because it looks so bad. Oh, that was just me. Sorry. <laughs> I swear it happened. I came home one day. My yard was cut. I was like, my God in heaven. This is great. <laughs> Got out of my car, stayed in my driveway. My 80-year-old neighbor. <laughs> hey, Ryan. Hey, John. Cut your grass for you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. He's like, well, actually, my wife cut it. <laughs> Tell Miss Dot I said thanks. <laughs> and we just get offended so easily because offense obscures our outlook. Isn't it ironic that God turned from his anger and Jonah turned toward anger? Jonah's outlook is so obscured by his decision to be offended that he can't even see the goodness and the grace of God. And that's what offense will do to you. It will obstruct your view of who God really is because you're choosing to be offended. You're choosing to serve your offense. Then look at an all-gracious and almighty God. You're looking at your offense and wanting to be mad over it and want it to be justified instead of trusting in the God who will take care of it. An offense just alters our outlook. It alters our perspective. So much so that we're not even seeing the right things. So offense, it, it alters your outlook. But number two, offended, just being in the state of offense, offended alters your attitude. Offended will alter your attitude. Jonah chapter 4 verse 4 says this. The Lord asks, I love this. This is God's response to Jonah. He's all mad. He's all offended. He's all ticked off. The Lord asks, is it right for you to be angry? 
Sometimes the Lord will have to tick you off of that truth before that truth will transform you. And I love how God will give you the truth without even saying it. Are, are you? Hold on. Who, who's God here? Are you right to be angry? And Jonah is so mad. And his attitude is so bad. He doesn't even respond. Look at verse 5. Jonah left the city, found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. Jonah didn't even respond to God's question. He just got mad and left. And he's going to sit up east of the city on a mountain to watch what's going to happen, see what God's going to do, see if something's going to happen. He's mad. He's upset. He's offended. And then the Lord God appointed a plant. And it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. And Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. Thank goodness his brother's happy about something. (laughs) And it was a plant. Maybe he's a vegan or vegetarian too. I don't know, okay? (laughs) But he's finally, in all of the story really, happy for once. And when dawn came the next day, short-lived, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant. And it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. Remember, he's sitting east of the city, a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Isn't it funny? Jonah didn't even answer God's question, didn't even give him a response, but God still provided him with grace. Provided a plan to cover him when he needed it most. Right? Protected him when he needed it most. And what's really cool is if you look at this and, and, and you do a little word study. I did a little word study. And the word for troubled, right? It says in his troubled time to rescue him. The, God grew, it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head and to rescue him from his trouble. The, the Hebrew word for trouble translated there is raha. We're going to learn together today. Say it with me. One, two, three. Raha. That same word to describe Jonah's trouble and his attitude at the moment is the same word used to describe the Ninevites' evil in earlier chapters. So in God's sight, Jonah's attitude was just as evil as the Ninevites' actions. It all comes back. The heart of the problem is really the problem of the heart. And offense and being offended, choosing to be offended, will absolutely alter you at a heart level. It'll alter your attitude. It'll alter your outlook. It'll alter your heart. When we choose to be offended, our attitude is affected. And God's so concerned with your heart. That's why offense is so troubling, and that's why it's so troubling in this story. It popped out like that. Is that offense troubles our heart, but God cares so much about your heart. He cares so much about your heart. If you read through the Scriptures, all through the Scriptures, you'll see Scripture after Scripture, passage after passage, where God is concerned with your heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, he says, Oh, that their hearts would come to know me and to fear me. God's concerned with your heart. If you look in 1 Samuel, where God appoints David as king of Israel, Samuel's looking at him and saying, This cannot be the king. He does not look like a king. God says, You look at the outside, but I look at the heart. If you see on Psalm 139, one of my favorite verses, one of the most quoted scriptures in all the Bible, it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Right? Jesus says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see the kingdom of God. The heart of the problem is really the problem of the heart. And the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all else. that No one can understand it. It's already bad enough on its own, but we add offense on top. And we choose to be offended. Offended is more than just a choice. It affects us at a heart level. So chapter 4, verse 9, God responds to Jonah. Then God asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah is so offended and so angry and has such a terrible attitude that he responds this time. Here's what he says. God says, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right. I'm angry enough to die. That had to be how he said it. Somebody asked you a question before, right? You just cold shoulder. And they ask you a question, and you're like, what do you want me to say? <laughs> you're like, you mad about the plant? Yeah. I'm mad about the plant. I'm mad enough to die. 
And this time we see that Jonah's outlook and attitude are so pervasive that he actually responds to God's questioning like he's right and God is wrong. And that's not a good place to be. Listen, only offense can make you think you're right when everyone else knows you're wrong. (laughs) Only offense can affect your outlook so much and your attitude so much that you begin to think you're right and everyone else is wrong, including God. And Jonah's offense had settled in so much that it begins to paint, he begins to paint himself as the victim even when God had just accomplished a great victory through him. And that's what offense will do. You begin to paint yourself as the victim. Oh, poor pitiful me. Oh, do you see what they said to me? Oh, you see what they did to me? Oh, you see the Facebook comment they left for me? Oh, you see that? And we begin to turn. And offense makes us turn inward. And I heard somebody say one time that the first step away from God's from God is a step away from God's people. And offense brings isolation. And isolation makes us turn inward. And turning inward pulls us away from what God wants to do in our life because offense completely obstructs your outlook and your attitude. And last but not least, being offended, choosing to be offended, alters your outlook, your attitude, but it also alters your outcome. Being offended can greatly affect your outcome. So Jonah chapter 4, verse 10. So the Lord said, Jonah fires off at God. Yeah, I'm, I am mad about it. Mad enough to die. And God responds, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night, it perished in a night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. Maybe God was a vegan too, I don't know. (laughs) God says, "You, you care more about the plant than you do people? An offense can alter your outcome because this is how the book of Jonah ends. This is it. There's no more verses, no other references to Jonah, his life, if God used him or not, anymore after this. Your response to offense will determine your future. And God will often put what you need on the other side of offense. So you have to make a decision to stay on this side and stay stuck in what you're dealing with and stay stuck in what what you're going through, stay stuck in what you've always been in and make a decision to grow up and get over it. Could God use Jonah again? Absolutely. Nothing is outside God's ability. But offense is so pervasive and it takes such root in our life and it affects our perspective and it affects our outlook and it affects our attitudes and it weaves its way into every part of our life so much that offense although God can use you again offense will maybe make it where you don't ever want to be used by God again not that God can't use you but offense will make you take the perspective and the stance that you don't, ever, you don't ever want God to use you again. Are we so caught up with our own comfort that it's crowded out any compassion for other people? Are we so caught up in stumbling over our own offenses and what's been done to us that we don't care about anyone else? So here's what I want to do today. I want us to stand all over this room. And I really feel, as I study for this message, that the antidote to offenses is just humility. 
the antidote to offense is just humility. And the best way to practice humility is worship. Because worship reminds you that you're not in control. And it connects you to a God who is. And so we're going to take a second to get humble. And I believe that God's looking for a church of people, a gathering of people, a body of people that says, you know what? I'm not concerned more with my comfort than I am God's calling. I'm not more concerned with the plant than I am other people. I'm not more concerned with, with, with what, what I want to do and my plans than God's purpose. I, I'm not more concerned about what people say about me than what God says about me. I'm not more concerned about a comment. I'm more concerned about what God's calling me to. I'm not more concerned about detriment to my reputation. I'm more concerned about the direction that I'm going in. And so we're going to take some time and worship. We're going to humble ourselves and say, God, if I have offenses, I want to let go of them. God, I release them to you. And we're going to sing that God's going to make a way for you to do that today.